Hi, I'm back. I'm ready to jump into my practice today. And so today what I'm going to work with is the prompt from the Kelly Creates Arts and Calligraphy group um, on Facebook. And today's prompt is Papillon, which I think means butterfly. I know those little dogs that are called Papillons are, isn't that because their ears and their face kind of have a butterfly sort of look to their coloring, I'm guessing. I don't know, I think I heard that. Anyway, I am going to use these colors. These are just blenders. I'm gonna use these three colors. So the lighter color on this, and then this color. And to give a quick, give you a quick rundown of what those colors look like. So this Tombow is a pale pink, a little bit peachy. And then this Artist Loft pen. I went through all my pens trying to find some pens that look like they would work well together. And that's a similar shade, but just a little bit darker. And then this is quite a bit darker. I'm not positive if I'm going to use the Artist Loft or if I'm just going to go in with the darkest shade over the palest. We'll just kind of have to wait and see what I choose, what I decide to do. I'll probably start the first one one way and see how it goes. And so I'm going to get started here. I'm using the Canson XL Smooth Bristol Paper. And I am not usually one to write out my words in pencil first. I just wing it. And I admit I end up making a lot of mistakes at this point because I do that and start over. I end up using the backs of pages or just using another piece of paper. I probably should use pencil, but it's just not my style. I don't really like to have to erase. So what I tend to do before I get started is I look at the blank piece of paper and I might just sort of finger trace. See, and I know if I did that, I would be not centered. So I would probably, yeah, I'll start right around here. And then I just go for it. I know that I want to have the, a flourish on the second piece, so I'm going to make my first piece sort of plain. I'm going to make that a little wider so that they match. That is a squeaky pen. And then I'm going to add a flourish for that L. And I don't know, here lately, I have just been in this thing where I stick the little heart over the eye. My, you know, my inner 12 year old girl's coming out. And so then I'm going to pull out a blender pen. I like to always check and make sure. So this is probably the one I used in that last video I made where I was just going over brush pen blending techniques. So I want to make sure that even though I, it is clean, even though I can see a little bit of color on the end of it, that color is not going to come through. And also what I always do is I cover up what I have just written because of my left-handedness and my capacity for smearing. Hmm. I am going to go in with the medium color just because I'm scared, I will admit. And already I can see that that's not that much different, is it? It's not going to give me a whole lot of contrast once I pull that out. So yeah, let's put the wrong cap on. Let's set that off to the side and let's just be brave. I'm going with the, no, wrong color. Not that brave. Whew. Something bad could have happened there. Okay, let's go for it. And then I'm just going to blend that down wipe off because I have too much and I don't want to I don't want to pull that color down too much farther. Alright. And I'm gonna do the same thing coming up from the bottom. Let me turn the paper a little bit. And just grab that color. Pull it up, wipe off some of the extra. So I want it to fade out. 
so that they just come together really sort of pale and light. And then I'm going to do that all the way through, one downstroke at a time. You can see that one faded out for me nicely. And I also, so when the um, when the dark part hits a upstroke, I like to just soften that edge a little bit and maybe pull it down through the upstroke. Same with down here. I just like that to be a soft thing. It's just my personal preference. Doesn't it's not any kind of rule that anybody made. It's just kind of you know I like that that seamless look. I just love this paper. It's a game changer for me. Soften that edge coming into the upstroke. remind me of flamingos. Especially that lighter color. But the darker color too, I guess, don't they give them some something in their feed that makes them be like the ones that are at the zoo? And they're deeper than the ones that you see in the wild and they put something in their feed that colors them. I don't know. I, again, I think I heard that. I don't think I would have made that up because I don't think about flamingos that carefully, so I must have heard it somewhere. It's interesting to me. I don't see, when I see other people showing videos of the way that they're blending, I don't see a lot of people using the blender pen. So that's really interesting to me because I've kind of fallen in love with the clear blender pen. I see a lot of people using the lighter color to create that um, blending. Once they've added their darker color, then they go back in with the lighter color to pull it through. But um, for me, I find that that deepens, you know, when you go over the lighter color with the same light pen again, it deepens it and it's no longer as light as it was. And I kind of like that lightness and I want to keep it. So same thing here, I'm gonna soften where that connects and see maybe it'll fade out as it moves through the upstroke. I like to have a little dimension to my upstrokes too. Sometimes I even go through with some colors that provide a little bit of contrast. Take off some excess so that I can blend it through more seamlessly. This one seems to be coming together fairly easy. I love that when that happens. Sometimes, well if you watched the video of my practice the other day, or um, what was the prompt, always be kind. That one did not go smoothly for me at all. I mean, it worked out in the end, it usually does. But that one was a little bit of a challenge for me. But I always think it's good to try and, um, to sometimes try and just work with what's happening and not be so wrapped up in what your expectations are and just 
enjoy the process and enjoy the little happy, as Bob Ross would say, the happy accidents, right? Sometimes I have to go back the and forth the other way. So a lot of times I like to move up into, as I get down to this part, I start moving back up, but I'm going to add a little more color to that. I feel like it faded out more than I would have liked. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to have a little bit of depth up there. Yeah, I'm going to have to be on the lookout for those Michael sales with this Canson XL Bristol. And then stock up. They're going to think I'm crazy. They already do think I'm crazy at Michael's. Because... Um, I have a little business where I make dolls and I buy an insane amount of embroidery floss when they have the right kind of sale. So I need to have those sales where, for me it doesn't do any good to have a large amount off of one item, right? I need a good percentage off the entire purchase and those coupons are very rare with Michaels. But if I find a 40% off your total purchase, like regular price purchase, because embroidery floss is never on sale, I will use that. And I have gone in and, you know, used a 40% off coupon on a purchase of over $200 worth of embroidery floss. So I end up getting over $100 off. But that is a lot of embroidery floss. And the poor cashiers have to ring each and every single one up individually. It's horrible for them. I feel so guilty. But I can't resist using that coupon and getting all that savings. So I do it, but I feel bad. Softening that edge and pulling it through. Usually when I do that, I end up maxing out what the register will accept. And so then they have to do it in two separate transactions and sometimes they don't know how to do that. It's, I've done that multiple times because you got to do what you got to do. Actually one time, this is embarrassing to even admit, but here I am admitting it. One time I was in Michael's buying a whole lot of embroidery floss and I was apologizing as she's ringing up each and every one because I, I do really feel bad that I have to make them work that hard and scan every single tiny little thing. And the cashier was like, oh, that's not that bad. I've heard a story of this one woman who, you know, bought so many that it maxed out the register. That was me. She was telling me a story about myself. I admitted to her that that was me. I'm like, I think that was me. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe I'm not the only one and... But I, from the, since it sort of became an urban legend at that Michaels, I'm kind of thinking it doesn't happen that often, and it probably was me. I can't imagine that many people are loading up on embroidery floss to the same degree that I do. See, if you watched my other video where we're, I was comparing the different pens, the Zig pens seemed like they were not behaving as nicely as the Tombow, but then here I'm using it with the Tombow, so maybe that's the difference that I'm using them together. But it seems to be working out just fine. The color's pulling through. I'm getting that good blend. So the Zig's not letting me down. Of course, this is the good paper, so I'm sure that makes a difference. Nice and smooth, nice and thick, doesn't absorb. That's the big thing. The only thing is I tried using this paper with the Karen Brush Marker Pro pens, which I'm still learning. I got them recently, and I haven't really 
giving them the time they need for me to get past the learning curve with them. There is a learning curve because they are so super juicy. And I tried using them on this paper and it was just crazy. Um, yeah, I'm, part of it was probably because I'm left-handed and you know, I put, I try to like just, I try to keep a piece of paper as a guard, but you couldn't do that with those pens because it was so wet and it stayed wet for a long time that it would create a mess on the piece of paper that I put down. And so I really couldn't, even if I just moved that piece of paper around, it was being problematic. The piece of paper was smearing. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take that Artist Loft pen, that middle color, and I'm gonna play with my flourishes a bit. So, this flourish in particular, it's kind of my favorite one coming off of it, crossing a T or coming off of an L or an H or a K. I like to make it look like this horizontal stroke is in front right here, but then behind right here. So it looks like that little end of the tail is coming up over and around. And so to do that, I want to have a little bit of shading right there on either side. And while it's still wet, pull it through. And I might get a little color on the end of my pen, just so I can get a little more depth. And then as I pull that through, I'm going to cross over here so that instantly puts that behind. And then I'm gonna do the same thing here, just come off of this. And then come around. I'm gonna add a little depth coming off of here too. Extend that. I'm going to extend that a little bit. My light color again. Am I the only person who does that with my finger? And just draws out to get some color on there. Figure out what's in front of what. So I want that loop to be very totally in the front, that little tail. I'll let it come around the front there too. For me, this is the fun part of flourishing is trying to create that illusion, illusion of some parts being in front of other parts. And so I want that thickest part to be in the very back. So I'm going to actually color with some solidness and then I'll blend out from there. Because whatever is darkest is going to look most in the back, right? I might even go in with a little bit of that darker color that I was using, the Zig Pen. Maybe just with the blender pen touching the Zig Pen. I think it will just for a little bit of depth, just has a little bit more of that depth as is in the darkest part. So same thing here, I'm just gonna touch there. Sorry, I am, a, I am a page spinner. I'm always trying to find the right angle to come at it from. But that's probably annoying. I was losing my pen tops too. 
So I want to come in with the medium pen as I come through this center part, right? So I want to change the tone just a little bit. I want it to be darker than the lightest. Blend that out. And add a little bit of depth here so that that's not boring. Especially coming off of the darker color. I'm not sure I really like that. I might could have left it how it was. I might have liked that better. Sometimes I mess with stuff a little bit too much and then regret it. But it's not a big regret. Because there's always another day for practice, right? This feels a little bit thin right here. I'm going to take a little bit of that zig pen and add a bit more depth to the outside here. Because that downstroke sort of felt like it was petering out. Soften these edges all through here. All right, clean off my pen, my blender. And then I am going to go in with a micron. I like to go in with a micron before I do my shading, my shadows. So I want to go in with a, uh, I'm going to pick the 03. I like to start smaller, so 03 is usually what my, the smallest I'll start with. It depends, though. I mean, every once in a while, I'll pull out a smaller one, but an 03 is probably good for about this, this size of writing. And I start with my upstrokes. And having just said what I said, I kind of wish I had started with smaller because that looks really contrasty. Not because of the size of the writing, but because of the paleness. I probably should have done an 01. It'll be okay, though. We'll make it work. And I like to do the upstrokes first, just because, well, for one reason, because they're lighter. And they can be easier to miss if you do them second because they sort of hide. They, everything can look finished with, um, you know, if you just take a quick glance, it might look finished. And then you come back to it later and you're like, oh, I missed some of those up, upstrokes. And I have a tendency to miss upstrokes as I'm lining. So I just like to do them first. Get them out of the way. The other reason I like to do them first is because it gives me the opportunity to see what things look like with a little bit of definition and then I can decide if I want to go in with a micron for the downstrokes or if I want to use a small tipped brush pen and have a little bit wider line on the side, on the left side. I always do the left and the bottom. So on the left side of the downstrokes, and I can decide, and it's easier to make that decision for me once I have already seen how it looks with the thinner upstrokes defined. So it's just the way I do things might not be the same logic that somebody else would use. Okay, that cross is in front. So yeah, I enjoy the little puzzle of making it look like these intersecting lines are going the way I want them to go. 
Ooh, I just went down too low with that because now I've turned into the left side. So I'm just going to pretend that didn't happen and meet it there. See, so yeah, it started to be, I probably should have ended it more like there. But that's one of those things that nobody's going to really notice it when they look at it. I'll know it. You'll know it now because I told you. But if I didn't tell you, you might not have noticed. And that one, I'm going to end it in the right place. And that's one of those things where I'm like, oh, gosh, I made mistakes. And everybody's like, I don't see any mistakes. Of course, at that point, I'm not going to tell you, but they're there. They are definitely there. And I'm going to outline this heart on the left side with the thin. It sh I don't know. I sometimes feel like I should do it like a downstroke, and sometimes I do, and I do it thicker. But that's kind of a thin heart right there. And I don't want to overpower it with the black. Keep it a little bit light and dainty. It took me the longest time to be able to do this black outlining with the micron without it looking like a totally shaky, wiggly line. So now when you first start learning how to use a brush pen and those upstrokes are just totally wiggly, that is what my black outlines look like for the longest time. And I, don't, I can't even put a finger on what was the difference that made it change. It must have just been continued practice. I think I am going to keep the lines on the outside to the left side of the downstrokes with a micron. Trying to decide between an 05 and an 08 because that was an 03 for the upstrokes. I think I'm going to go, I don't want to do the, the thick brush pen downstrokes. Just because that color, I want to keep it kind of light. So I'm going to go in with the 08 and cross my fingers that I don't regret doing that and that I don't end up wishing I had gone in with the 05. But I want there to be a little bit of contrast. Did you see what I did there? I missed that. Got my 03 right there. And see, that's the thing. that By going in with the upstrokes first, as I go in with the downstrokes, it's almost like I have the opportunity to check my work. So yeah, I wanted there to be a little bit of contrast between the thickness used for the upstroke and the downstroke. I actually like how that 808 is working. I went a little bit outside the line there, but I have noticed that when you do that, it doesn't really matter. If I accidentally don't get right on the very edge, if I go a little bit like that to where you can still see the color to the left of my line, I just pretend like it didn't happen. If I end up making my line a little bit too far to the left and there's a gap of white, just a little tiny line of white between my color and my black outline, I have learned to do not ever, ever, ever go back over it with the black line. And that's the tendency. You've got the black pen in your hand and you just want to have to make it a little thicker and I'll make that white spot go away. Don't do it. Wait till you're done. Wait till the black has dried and then go back in with the color because then it will be a, a clean repair. If you go in with the black, you end up getting too thick of a black line. It stands out. It looks like a mess. I am going to darken the outside, I think. Just that one. Yeah, I like that. It's subtle. See, I went off the line a little bit again, but it doesn't really matter. Once you get it all done, once you add some shadows in too, it is far less noticeable. Hmm. I'm not sure if I should have gone all the way down on there, if I should have started up here. A little too late now is what it is. Alrighty. Do you see that subtle bit of contrast between the thicker 08 on the downstrokes and then the thinner 03 on the upstrokes? It's subtle, but I think it works, especially when I don't want to have too much heavy black. 
So for the shadow, I'm going to do a shadow that touches the black line. So they're not going to leave it. It's not going to be a drop shadow where there's space of white between the shadow and the, and the letter, the color. Only because I've got a lot going on here with the flourishing. And I don't have a ton of, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Negative space between the letters. I think that would make it a little bit too busy. And I think here I just want to let the color really be what shines. So I'm going to go and put my paper down again and I'm going to use the darker end of this brushables, the Zig brushables. And I like to just ride that black line. So the Micron is waterproof. And so you can touch it and it's not going to bleed. I had another pen. What was it? This one. It's a Kurataki Fuda Gokechi. And I pulled this out. I don't really use that pen that often. It's a pretty soft tip for a small tipped pen. And I tend to like something that's kind of a medium tip. The Tombow Fudenosuke's are a little hard for me. I use them, but they're a little bit hard for me. I just prefer, the tip is hard for me, not that they're challenging, but I find that the firmer tip just doesn't suit my preferences. I like a little bit softer. But then the Tombow Fudenosuke that has the soft tip is a little too soft for me. And I really like the Pentel sign pens with the brush tips because they're kind of right in between the hard and soft Tombow Fudenosuke pens. Speaking of the Fudenosuke's, that is one of my, so I am kind of one of those, those grammar cop kind of people. And I admit it, I'm one of those annoying people. Because I homeschooled my kids probably and it's been my job when teaching my own children grammar to always be correcting their grammar and pointing out the correct, you know, just how they should be saying something. Well, my daughter has been learning Japanese for years. It's, she's all into the anime and the manga. She loves everything Japanese. And when, so what's really nice about that is when I get pens that have Japanese writing on them, she can tell me what the packaging says a lot of the times. And she also knows how to pronounce things. So whereas, you know, I would have no idea how to pronounce something and I would just try and be a little bit phonetical about it. She can tell me, oh, no, that's wrong. This is how you're supposed to pronounce it. And I would watch some YouTube videos where people would talk about the Tombow Fudenosuke's and my daughter about had a temper tantrum. She was just, oh, she thought it was like, that is not how it's pronounced. And so she corrected me. Now I have to say Fudenosuke. And um, because of that, when every time I hear Fudenosuke, I'm cringing right along with my daughter. She ruined me. So anyway, the Tombow food no escape pens are they're not my favorite I like them they're just not my favorite as far as a small tip brush pen my favorite is the Pentel sign pens I have a couple other favorites too that are pens that are a little bit more obscure that you don't really ever hear much about that have a similar tip to the Pentel sign pen I like the way the gray is looking with that shrimpy, salmony, peachy pink. I don't think I ever would have um, 
thought to put the those two colors together in something, but I like it. I'm going to use a lighter color to blend where those just touched. And maybe pull a blender pen out because I really don't like that when a gray, when you can see the, like a line in the gray. I don't like it when I do that. It's one of those things. I always try and be really aware when I'm working with, because this is practice, right? When, so when I'm practicing, I try to be really aware of what I like that I'm doing and then what I do that I don't like so that I can kind of make that mental note that I don't want to do that again so that I can always be aiming to improve, aiming to get better, or aiming to do things that I do prefer so that someday it'll all come together and I'll just feel like a pro, right? All right, so the only thing that's bugging me here is I don't like how my gray came over this part here. And what I'm gonna do to try to blend that is to come back in with this pale pink, same thing here. I'll try and clean that up just by deepening the light color any place that I've touched so that the pink has a little more prominence there. And so you're seeing that instead of seeing where my gray shadow line, it just happens sometimes because that pen has a fatter tip. Also because I use it a lot and it probably could stand to be replaced. It's not having the easiest time finding those zig brushables anymore at a decent price. You know, I had thought I had bought them at Am on Amazon and I actually went back through my history and couldn't find them. And then I remembered that I bought them at Hobby Lobby. And so they're just not likely to get them back. All right. That seems to add a little bit of depth right there. Just have this thing. I don't like my upstrokes to look too flat sometimes. So now all I need is a little touch of white. Where did I put? There it is. I'm going to go in there with the, I think, so the Uniball, I don't know if it's Signo or Sino. I'm going to actually, if I had to guess, I think it's probably Sino because my daughter was explaining to me that they call pens sign pens in Japan, and this says made in Japan, because they are referring to actually using it to sign like your name on a document. So I'm just gonna do my favorite lately, and I have to be real careful to use a light upstroke on this because this pen, I've had it for a while and it's not really behaving. And if I can't get it to behave, I'm gonna switch to something else. But I've been liking just a line and some dots. Yeah, you know what? That line, it could be nicer. I'm going to switch gears and see if this, what is it, Molotov? Molito? Molito? If that's going to work for me nice, more nicely. But I think it is. And I think it isn't. Let me shake it. That seems to have helped. Here we go. And a dot, two, three. I'm gonna darken those dots because it seems to be a little bit more opaque. One, two, three. There we go now, it's starting to wake up. I like these pens a lot. They can be a little bit hard to get going sometimes, but they're an acrylic paint pen, so they're really nice and opaque. Make those highlight 
marks really pop. One, two, three. And they dot really easily. I'm just going to do one little dot right there on the heart. And then one, two, three. It's all nice and juicy and working. Okay. I think that we will call that done. Thanks for joining me. Let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to leave any comments. Feel free to make requests for what you might like to see a video on in the future. I'm happy to do it. Talk to you later, friends. Bye.